Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. In case you're not familiar with us, the Sacred Inclusion Network is an emerging community of people who are actively exploring the integration of what people call diversity and spirituality. Now, a lot of us have different opinions as to what that looks like, but for me personally, I see sacred inclusion as nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. You can find more about us by going to our website, sacredinclusion.com. Today, I'm honored to interview Christina King. Christina King is an activist and community leader. And if you're watching on video, you may not be aware, or even if you're listening on audio, that she's also a trans person. A couple of months ago, she, she participated in a national pageant. She is also Miss Trans Illinois. And in the national pageant, she got Miss Congeniality. And if you can imagine, if you if you don't know Christina, um, she's in a way. Some people might say she has like a lots of strikes against her in life. Um, not only is she a trans person, which makes her a um, let's say a persecuted minority in many circles. Uh, she's also from a rel relatively traditional family, um, and uh, you know she's African American. If you can see from if you're if you're on the if you're on the video podcast, um, one of the things that Christina has done is that she created a, a supportive community in the Galesburg, Virginia area, that, that she, and she's created something called Safe Space, which allows people within the LBQTQ plus community to come together and converse. And uh, to some to some folks, she's quite a role model, and I think she's an inspiration. So in any event, Christina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Angelo. Christina, I th I'd like to start by Telling me a little bit about your own spiritual and religious background. Yeah, so first, it's Galesburg, Illinois. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, so yeah, I grew up in a, um, I'm originally from the South, so I'm originally from South Carolina. And we moved here when I was little, so I grew up in Illinois. And I grew up in a pretty conservative faith. Um, it's uh, Lutheran Missouri Synod was the faith I was baptized in, confirmed in, and so um, it's a pretty staunch, very conservative. Um, I almost liken it to Catholicism, even though it is very anti-Catholicism. Um, there's a lot of similarities in structure and um, and how strict that they are. So um, I grew up basically in a Midwest house that was pretty conservative, um, both politically and religiously. So it's been an interesting voyage. <laughs> so what was it like, you say it's a conservative community that you, you grew up in, in a household. What was it like being a trans person in the midst of all that? Um, it has definitely been interesting. Um, so I originally, when I was still attending the church I grew up in, I originally came out at about 12 as gay. Um, as a gay male, this was prior to my transition, and I always knew that I was a woman. I've always known since I was maybe three. As soon as I could talk and I have memories, I remember knowing deep down inside my heart that I wasn't like the other boys, that there was something different, that I didn't want to be like the boys, I wanted to be a girl, I knew that I was a woman. Um, and so, it's it's been okay. Um, I come from a even though I come from a conservative community, I've had a lot of wonderful people here who support me, who love me, who um, rally behind me when it's time for my pageants and things. So that's always really awesome. So, tell me, what what, what is your what did your trans how did how did that impact your relationship with the church? Um. So I stopped attending the church I grew up in when I was maybe 16, 17, probably about 17. Um, because in that church, being homosexual is a huge sin. Um, I think it's like one of the top two sins that they look at. And so that definitely was hard. Um, because, I mean, as you know, when you have your faith and you go to a church, you have like a, it's a structure, it's a family, if you will. And so um, I, it was difficult to lose that. Um, it was, you know, it's the only church family I knew since the time I was 
little, little, I mean, they, these people watched me, they babysat me, they watched me grow, I watched them age, you know, all of these different pieces. And so happening to leave that for my own well-being, um, I, I wasn't wanted in that space and I didn't feel like when I would walk into that space, it wasn't a genuine feeling of like, oh my gosh, Chris, it's so great to see you. It was just kind of like, oh, you're back again this week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it just got to the point that I said to myself, you know, I would, I, and I said to my family, you know, I would rather either sign up to work every Sunday, which I did for a while, and that was my excuse to not go to church, <laughs> or I would rather stay in bed and not have to, um, feel as awful about myself you know I as a transgender person who was fighting their own identity I already felt horrible about myself and so I was like I could stay in bed and feel bad about myself and I have to get up get dressed and feel even worse so we're talking about your um you know your your religious background but but how about your how did how did being trans affect your spiritual um, aspect of yourself it's been, it's been an interesting journey. Um, spiritually, I was very conflicted. So growing up in a Lutheran, a very conservative Lutheran faith, um, all of us, and all of us who grow up in faith, we become indoctrinated, no matter what the views are. And so I was indoctrinated that it was bad and I was going to hell. And so that was very hard for me. It was um, spiritually very damaging because... I came to a place where I either had to be myself or kill myself. And those were, wow. um, and so for me, it was very difficult because one, I mean, you, if you kill yourself, what I was always taught growing up was that you go to hell. And so it's like, okay, I go to hell if I kill myself because I can't be myself. And if I do be myself, I'm going to hell because I am my true authentic self. So that's, that was very, very difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, it sounds it sounds it sounds terrible, actually. I mean, this is this is kind of a, a silly question, I guess. But give me your sense as to everybody has a spiritual journey in life, um, especially people who are, believe in the I'll call it the spiritual path. How do you think that um, transgender folks in general? How is it different from non-transgender or so-called straight folks? Um, I think, and I can only speak for my own journey, but as a trans person, I feel that a lot of us in the community have been hurt by religion. And so it's a very difficult thing. Um, I know a lot of my trans brothers and sisters, when we talk about faith, it's very difficult for us because a lot of us do come from faith backgrounds. I mean, if you look at the United States, predominantly most people grow up in some sort of faith background. And so... It's difficult because so many of us have been hurt and coming back from that, it's, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to mm. come back from that place of hurt and pain to try and um, believe in something that has attacked you your whole life. I guess it would be the easiest way to think about it. It's... Um, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, it's almost like having a dog and you love that dog. And every time you walk in a room, that dog attacks you. Oof. And you want to learn how to love that dog. And then you, there's really no way to do so because every time you go into that speech, you're being attacked. And so I think for a lot of the LGBTQIA community, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult because you do gain connections, you know, like my old church family. There are some of those people I still just love and care for and, but every time I see them, I mean, it, it's hurt. It hurts. It definitely hurts. So how did you how did you come to a place of acceptance with yourself? And also, um, if you're from a religious background, how did you get right with God and be accept, accept yourself at the same time? What was that process like? Um, it was a pretty long process. It was a few years. Um, I would say I kind of lived in this very dark place. I was, um, I went through a really awful breakup, had a nervous breakdown and was just in a very dark place. And I remember a friend of mine who is my pastor currently, um, 
I do community theater with her and her husband. And she said, oh, why don't you come to our church? You know, we're open, we're affirming, basically meaning that they are LGBTQ friendly as a church. And I said, you know, Pam, I love you, but it's not for me. I, I'm done with the religion thing. And I think I finally hit a wall and I just, I felt this void. Um, growing up with faith, I always had some sort of net, if you will, right? When you are in the, you know, the deep of the night and something wakes you up and you are just in agony, it's that moment where you can call out to someone, right? And you can say, you know, dear God, please help me. I need your guidance. I need you to guide me. And I didn't have that. Um, and it was really, it was very difficult. It was very, very difficult for me. Um, and so finally I, you know, I gave her church a chance and I came here and I said, fine, I'll show up on Sunday. And it was just, it was just a feeling for me. And I, I learned something in the church that I attend now, which is First Lutheran Church. It's an ELCA church. It's Reconciling in Christ. And I learned about grace. That was the biggest thing. I had never been taught about the grace of God and what that looks like. And so having a pastor who said, hey, first of all, none of us are perfect. Second of all, God doesn't make mistakes and God made you. And hearing that message really, it really did change my life because I, I never knew that, right? I always was told God doesn't make mistakes but you are defying God. And so to hear God doesn't make mistakes, if this is how you've always felt, there's a reason that you are in the positions you are. Look at your life, look at what you've done and what you can do. Like there's a reason why you've been put here. So it sounds like it was useful to have a straight, a straight ally, if you will. Yes, yes, oh yes, for sure. So tell me about this safe space thing that you, you started. Um, share about what is, share a little bit about what it's like to create it, um, what it's like and what it's done for you? Yeah, so after the 2016 election, um, my pastor and I felt that we needed a safe space for people to come be themselves where they could, um, you know, we could break bread together, we could talk, we can talk about spirituality, we can talk about politics, we can talk about family, we can talk about all of these different pieces, and everyone can be their true authentic self. And so um, we started this, we started a group called Safe Space, and that was the goal, was just, we wanted everyone to be able to come to the table, no matter race, age, um, ethnicity, background, no matter what you identified as, we wanted you to be able to come and be your true authentic self. And so um, we started the group at, right after the election, and it was for people 18 years old to 30, or through their 30s. And so we just kind of, again, we just wanted that space where people could be themselves and could feel comfortable in that space to know that I can come out, I can live as my true self in some capacity. So what is the relationship to spirituality and religion with this safe space group, or is there, is there none? Is it just simply a place for people to gather and to sort of experience acceptance? Um, yes and no. So um, it's held in a church, but it really isn't spiritually based. Um, we do talk about spirituality, um, obviously, as a way for us to, as a reconciling Christ church, it's a way for us to reach back out into the community and say, hey, we know the church has hurt you. We know that this has happened how can we help? What can we do to make sure that you feel safe? And we've talked about, um, I would say the most spiritual that we get is we have to have discussions on spirituality. And we've had people of the Wicca faith and people from my church, people from, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, other faith denominations who have come in and we've sat down and we've talked about our different belief systems and how we grew up and what doctrine we follow and what does that look like for all of us? Cause it's very fascinating to, I think it's such a beautiful thing to listen to people's stories and to see and to break bread with people who are not like you. So you can, I think it's a perfect way for us to learn about each other and to learn to love each other. 
And so um, I would say the most spiritual we've gotten is that um, we've talked a lot about the clobber verses throughout the few years that it's been going on, um, just because that is so predominantly what is used against us as a community. I'm sorry, about the what? I didn't understand. What... The, the clobber verses. The, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. What is that? Um, the clobber verses are, and I would have to send the list to you, um, they're the verses like, um, if a man lays with another man, he shall be stoned. Those okay, so they're, they're sort of like anti-gay religious uh, yeah, Bible it, texts. It, yeah, so basically it's the verses that are used by, conserv- we'll say conservative faiths, right. um, to condemn the LGBTQ community. Okay, um, imagine I'm from someplace that, um, and, and I don't, I've never met a trans person, right? Uh, and I may think that I've never even met a gay person. There are people like that, believe me. They think they've never met I a person. I know. Uh, <laughs> it always shocks me. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask you a very country simple question. What do you think most people like that don't get about the trans experience? Hmm. About your experience? I would say the biggest misconception that I face as a trans woman um, is that there's this look. (laughs) We're supposed to look and sound a certain way. And so when we don't fit that mold, people are like, well, I I didn't know that you were trans. And it's like, were you supposed to? (laughs) And so um, I think that we are so, as a society, we are so bent on putting labels on everything. And, and I, you know, I'm not opposed to labels, but I think that we get so stuck in our binary and we get so stuck in, you have to be this or this, and there's no in-between zone that we forget that there are lots of gray areas in life. You know, isn't it, it's, it's, it's less of a case with younger people, don't you think? It's less of a case, you said? No, it's like, um, lots of young people are not so hung up on um, right. like identities, um, yes. sexual identities in particular. Yeah. Oh, no, I completely agree. So, um, I guess the last question, Christina, um, you know, these are, these are tough times in lots of ways, you know? Um, politics is, 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 is unusual, to, say, to make a long story short. You've got climate change going on. Um, in my opinion, everybody needs to do something to keep, to keep themselves basically be okay, <laughs> to, be, right. to be connected to um, you know, that which is beyond us. What do you do to keep yourself um, connected, I'll call it? What do I do? Um, well, obviously, I'm an activist. <laughs> I also um, I do a lot of prayer. I try to pray and meditate because it is so easy in today's times like you said we are seeing things today that we have never seen and i'm only 26 i just turned 26 november and so we're seeing things now that in my lifetime have never ever happened and so a lot of prayer i pray for us as a country i pray for those that hate myself and my brothers and sisters i pray that they find some sort of peace and that they find what it is about themselves that brings out this evil, if you will. Um, I just, that, I mean, that's what I do. I pray, I hope for better times. Um, it, it's sad. It really is sad. There are so many people nowadays who are just stuck in this dark zone, if you will, of negativity. And so I just hope that they find their inner peace and that they learn to love themselves. Mm. You know, and then I I just pray that, um, you know, I know uh, you and I have talked prayer, um, and I just pray that this moment is kind of like um, a poem that you and I have talked about prior as well, that um, the Footprints in the Sand poem, that, you know, when we look back and we look at our lives and we say, where was God at this time that we can say it was in this moment that I carried you? Mm. 
I wonder if you have that poem candy. I, I would I would love to have you have you read it for me. Okay, I'll close this out. Yeah, take your time. I can pull it up here. And while she's looking for it, in case you're not you're wondering what the crown thing is that she's wearing on <laughs> her head, it's obviously um, she got this from um, from winning a pageant. Okay, so I've got it. Okay. <laughs> so the poem is called Footprints in the Sand. And the author, I want to say, is unknown. It's been kind of just circulated around for years, but it's something I have hanging up in my house. Um, and it starts with, One night I dreamed a new dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the sky flashed dark scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one beginning, one belonging to me and the other one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along my path, especially in the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest times and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. Never ever. During your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Mm. Well, um, I'm going to say formally goodbye in a minute, but I want to tell people about our, our little network, which I hope you will um, be a part of. Um, people want to get more involved in the Sacred Inclusion Network. There's several ways to do so. Um, the simplest thing, the easiest way is to join our private Facebook group. Um, you can find us by going looking for a, doing a search for Sacred Inclusion on Facebook, and you can find us. And if you ask to be invited, I will let you in. Um, also, on the third Saturday of every month, we have um, online community gatherings about various topics. You can go to our website and look under past events to get some idea of what they are. And third, if you want to support the podcast, um, you can do so by going to Patreon, and there's a way to contribute and, in effect, become a sponsor of the show. Um, Christina, um, I hope that this um, little conversation we've had will bring some understanding to people. Um, and uh, I'm so so grateful that you've taken this time to share with me today, and um, you know, shine on. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me, Angela. I really appreciate the opportunity. Great.